Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this meeting of the Planning Committee, Thursday the 9th of November 2023. Um, my name's Caleb Tomlinson, I'm the councillor for Bamber Bridge West, and I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, committee members and members of the public are reminded that this meeting is being streamed live to YouTube, so behave yourselves, please. All right, if you're attending the meeting because you're a member of the public who was registered to speak, you have a time limit of four minutes. I will ask you to come to the desk, press the speak button, introduce your yourselves, and then you can make your presentations. Uh, voting will be undertaken by a show of hands, the good old-fashioned way, and the outcome of the vote will then be confirmed by our legal officer, Dave, once complete. Okay, I'll begin with some housekeeping. Please, can you ensure your mobile phones are on silent or switched off? Uh, we're not anticipating a fire alarm drill, but if the and if the alarm does go off, it means you need to leave the building. The exits are behind you, and we'll all meet on the car park. Okay, so if I can ask everyone to introduce themselves, we will start with the young man on my left. Hi, I'm David Whelan, the Council's Head of Legal and Procurement. Ben Story, Democratic Services Officer. Good evening, Catherine Smith, Councillor for Broadfield uh, Ward. Good evening, Matthew Farnworth, Councillor for Seven Stars. Good evening, Councillor Phil Smith, representing uh, New London and Hutton East. Good evening, Councillor David Shaw, representing Howick and Priory in Penwitham. Good evening, Councillor Peter Molyneux, Sandra in Walton Ward. Uh, good evening, Councillor Hayden Williams, representing Leyland Central. Good evening, Councillor Mary Green, representing uh, Mossad and, and Midge Hall. Good evening, Councillor Elaine Stringfellow, representing Lost Stock Hall Ward and Vice Chair. Good evening, Chris Alby, Development Planning Team Leader. Good evening, Debbie Roberts, Development Management Team Leader. Good evening, Lisa Matthewson, Senior Planning Officer. Good evening, Janice Crook, Planning Officer. Good evening, Catherine Thomas, Planning Manager. All right, everyone, thanks very much for that. OK, we have no apologies for absence, but I do have apologies for lateness from a senior nurse from the NHS who's actually stuck in traffic, but he is on his way to us, and that is Councillor Will Adams. OK, do we have any declarations of interest on tonight's meeting? No? OK, I have read and agreed with the meeting minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of October 2023. Can I have a seconder? Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shaw. Thank you, Chair. I've got lots of seconders tonight. All right. So if you were here, please let's have a show of hands if you agree with the minutes. Yeah. Dave? That's been approved, Chair, uh, unanimously. OK, thanks for that. Um, and moving swiftly on to agenda item number five, uh, appeal decisions. Catherine. Uh, thanks, Chair. No, we haven't got any appeal decisions to report this month. OK, thanks for that. I'll, I'll just let members of the committee know we, we've changed the running order tonight, but we can't change your uh, iPad. So anyone wishing to present to committee, we've moved their applications forward in the running order. So item one on tonight's running order is Land off Shawbrook Road and Altkey Lane, Leyland. Item number two will be Ginger Ale Penwitham, which will be heard at the same time as Furham Gin Penwitham. And we will hear from both, and then we'll have people who want to speak in objection or in favour. Then we'll have ward members or other ward members in the vicinity. And then we have Hool Village Hall. OK, and then after that, we haven't got anybody wish, wishing to speak on any of the other applications. OK, is that 
Are we all happy with that? Yeah. Okay, let's move on then to item number one. Land off Shawbrook Road and Oakley Lane, Leyland. Um, and Chris, if you'd like to present this item, thank you. Thank you, Chair. The proposal um, relates to part of a major residential development site, P, in the South Rubble Local Plan. Outline planning permission was granted in 2017 for up to 400 dwellings on the section of the site under the control of Red Room. The remainder of the site is being developed by Lavors. In March, tw uh, sorry, in 2022, reserve matters approval was granted for 154 dwellings on phases four and five, which were to be built as one. The current application would supersede the previous reserve matters approval and proposes changes to the detailed construction of all house type to reflect current building regulation requirements and changes to the approved layout around the two affordable um, parcels, which um, are now to be developed in two distinct phases. The proposal does not alter the number of consented dwellings the number of uh, each house types on the site or the improved uh, or the approved internal road layout the layout of the wider scheme remains unchanged these excerpts show the loss of one market house on phase four with two additional affordable units um, proposed this area here And on phase five, there is a gain of one market units and a loss of two affordable units. Oops, sorry, the screen is frozen. Spare with us. Apologies for that. Um, this is um, and on phase five, there's a gain of one market units and a loss of two affordable units. Uh, if the changes um, are into this area and this area over here. So overall, between the two phases, the same number of market and affordable units are proposed. I mentioned previously the proposed changes to the detailed construction of all house types to reflect current building regulation requirements. This would not result in a noticeable change to the appearance of the house types, as shown by the example house types on this slide. The application site is part of a parcel of land that the council wishes to see come forward for residential development. The development would provide a SIL payment circa £1.49 million and facilitate the extension to Worden Park. For these reasons and those contained within the report, the application is recommended for approval subject to the imposition of conditions. As well, thank you, Chair. All right. Uh, thanks for your struggling presentation, Chris. Um, I'd well let you down again. Right. OK, we don't have any objectors on this application. We don't have any members of the public wanting to speak in support. We don't have any ward members with us. We do, however, have the applicant, uh, Mr Anthony Blackwell, wishing to address us. Good evening, sir. If you come forward and just press the red button. OK, you have four minutes. Thank you. I'll be uh, I'll be really brief. My name's Tony Blackwell. I'm the technical manager at Red Row Homes. 
Um, I'd like to thank you for the consideration of this Reserve Matters application um, and the Planning Officer for a very comprehensive um, report. It is as stated, um, it, it is really just a substitution application um, to allow for phasing and to allow for, for the new house types. Uh, the, the major change of the house type is um, is to deal with Partel and will now include air source heat pumps um, rather than gas boilers. So um, thank you for your consideration and um, uh, I ask that you approve the application. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Okay, we are now going to open this up to committee. Council Smith. Yes, yeah, th thank you, Chair. I think the, the application, as we've seen before, I think this finalises the uh, the site itself. Uh, it delivers everything it should deliver for this council and for the community. Therefore, I'll move approval, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Council Smith. Oh, sorry, Councillor Farmworth. <laughs> I'd just like to second Councillor Smith's uh, approval. For okay, thanks Councillor Farnworth. Do we have any other proposals? No. Okay, so we'll move straight on to the vote. This is for approval for Land Office Road and Oak Lane. This is for approval. A show of hands, please. Dave? Uh, yes, Chair, everyone voted in for, uh, for, I was just wondering about Councillor Adams, but he's voting for as well, so. It was just, just to abstain, just uh, yeah. just because obviously I wasn't here for the presentation, so I don't think it's appropriate for me to. to yeah, I, I, th I think that's fine, Councillor Adams, so in effect it was a unanimous vote, just one abstention because Councillor Adams was slightly late. Okay, thanks for that, the clarification on that, Dave. Uh, welcome, Councillor Adams. Thanks for all your hard work for, for the community. Um, Okay, so that's approved. If you were just here for that one item, I'd advise you to leave. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. <laughs> All right, um, so moving on to item number seven and item number eight, which are going to be um, presented together. Uh, so it's Ginger Ale, 14 Liverpool Road, and Fairham Jane, 14 B Liverpool Road. Janice. Thank you, Chair. Where are we? Beginning. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Oh, I'll just run through the ginger ale presentation and then I'll run through the uh, Fairham gin presentation. So the ginger ale premises is on Liverpool Road in the Penwitham District Centre and it's located close to the junction of uh, Priory Lane, Cot Lane and Liverpool Road. So the premises is one of three units formed when the former Booth supermarket was subdivided and refurbished and, and it formed one restaurant and two retail units. <clears throat> Since then, both retail units have, have been subject to change of use applications from retail to drinking establishments. Conditions were imposed on the ginger ale with condition nine restricting the hours of use of the external area until 8 p.m. And condition 10 ensured that tables and chairs to the outside area were removed at the same time. <clears throat> so the proposal now is to extend the hours of use of the external area until 10 p.m. and accordingly vary condition 10 to allow the tables and chairs to be outside until 10 p.m. So this site layout plan just shows the ginger ale premises and the external seating area. Um, so this is just an image of the external seating area to the front of the ginger ale and the adjacent properties, which are also subject to applications to extend the hours of use of the external areas. So at first floor, there are apartments. Um, and an external amenity area to two of the apartments, which is directly above the ginger ale. 
It's considered that the proposal to extend the external seating area until 10pm would have a detrimental impact on the residential amenity of the occupants of the apartments by encouraging people to sit out later into the evening when residents could reasonably expect to enjoy their evenings. So whilst it's recognised the premises is within the district centre, opposite the Tesco supermarket and close to the busy crossroads junction, must be uh, noted that as the evening and night time progresses, the background sound level in, uh, in an area such as this will begin to drop off which will exacerbate any intrusive patron noise due to the use of the external seating area. Additionally, the premises licence restricts the hours of use of the external area until 8pm in line with the planning permission. So the application is recommended for refusal. So I'll just move on to the second presentation for Fairham's Gin. So again, it's uh, located close to the um, the busy crossroads junction of Cot Lane, Priory Lane and Liverpool Road. And again, is within the district centre of Penwitham. And again, it's one of the three units that were formed when the former booze supermarket was subdivided and has since become changed from retail unit to a drinking establishment and condition nine was imposed to restrict the hours of the use of the external seating area to between 10 a.m and 8 p.m with a proposal now to extend the use until 10 p.m so this just shows the uh, again shows the internal floor area and the outside seating area and this is just an image, so you can see that it's adjacent to the ginger ale, which you know, which is the one that I've just run through. So the first floor apartments, um, one of them is partially above Ferrum's Gin, and again with its external seating area, and obviously. In line with the, the previous report on ginger ale, it's considered that, that it has a potential to impact on the residential amenity of the occupants by encouraging people to sit out later into the evening. So again, whilst it's appreciated that the premises is within the district centre opposite Tesco supermarket and a busy crossroads junction, again, as the evening progresses, the background sound levels in the area begin to drop off and then any noise will be exacerbated by patrons sitting outside. And again, the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> OK, thank, uh, thanks for that, Janice. Janice. Um, right, on um, seven and eight, don't have any objectors but on seven and eight, we do have members of the public wishing to speak in support of the applications. And obviously, this is the presentations that we're going to give you are on seven and eight. But we need to, when we open the debate, we need to vote on them separately. Yeah? Because the separate applications, even though they look the same, the different applicants. So, OK, so starting with... A Warren Ward, please. Good evening. Good evening. Um, okay, you've got four minutes, Warren. Okay. Excuse the uh, somewhat scripted um, text I've had to write. I didn't have much time to prepare, to be fair, and it's quite important to uh, to support these local businesses. So I'm going to read a bit from a script, but I'll try and bring some of it to life as, as I do so. So I'm Warren Ward. Um, I live just around the corner from the premises um, occupied by 1260 Ginger Rail and Fair and Gin. I'm a local resident and a local investor. Um, I, over the last 10 years of living there, walked past that shop whilst it was empty um, and derelict 
with wa chronic water ingress and a, and a bit of an eyesore to the high street. And um, after plucking up a little bit of courage and a, and, a, and a truckload of cash, I decided to buy the premises and bring it back into uh, active use. With the support of Janice, we uh, we got the plans approved, and um, and from 2018 we refurbished the building and um, and brought it back into use with these three commercial units, one of which is 1260 Grafton Crust, the Pizzeria, and now the two uh, bars. So I own the freehold to the building, which encompasses the shops, which I then lease back to the uh, the business owners. And I also own the freehold to the flats upstairs, which are on diminishing short-term leases. Um, it's probably also worth noting that I actually own the flat. I bought the lease to the flat, which you'll see on Janice's pictures, which is at the front and directly above the uh, space that the, that the businesses are looking to convert into um, or, or extend their hours of use, as it were. So, And the tenant of that flat's actually here, and he's going to speak as well uh, in support of the application. So... Um, so these three units, I think it would be fair to say, um, the conversion of them, you know, with the support of South River Borough Council has enabled um, a number of startups with quite unique brands, whose heritage lies in Pemberton, widely widely covered by a lot of the um, the local magazines as being great places to go and with great products. Um, and they provide jobs for circa 30 people in the local community, which I think is quite important. Um, I am aware of a, a problematic leaseholder in the building. Um, I have tried to reconcile um, the relationship with that particular leaseholder um, with goodwill, with uh, lots of conversation, but not really to much avail. So that matter I'm having to deal with legally is the freeholder for the building. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the businesses and the trading conditions on the high street, and I'll try and speed it up because I've only got four minutes. Um, so. Um, I think COVID and post-COVID has proven extremely challenging times for all the businesses and the current economic downturn is making trading conditions extremely challenging. Um, there's drop off in trade, turnover uh, and, and consequently margins. So it's, it's getting pretty tough. Um, and that's primarily why these businesses need to maximise the trading space and the trading hours in order to survive and trade through uh, what is a difficult economic period and actually recover from the impact of the pandemic. Um, I think it's also important to raise the fact that I think fairness and balance on the high street um, in order to create fair competition is a pretty important factor too. And there are businesses further up the high street that benefit from these extended trading hours uh, and what we see down at the three units at 14 Liverpool Road is at eight o'clock, there's a mass exodus of everybody walking up the high street to go to the other two or three venues that have got a later trading license outside to enjoy their time up there rather than down at 14 Liverpool Road. And that obviously has an impact on, on the businesses that occupy 14 Liverpool Road. Um, so the the idea really of the extended trading hours is to help these businesses i personally am supporting these businesses um i've been subsidizing service charges through the introduction of my own cash to ensure the building remains in a good state of repair and looks well on the high street um during the difficult times i'm sort of here asking for your support which along with mine uh, will hopefully see these businesses trade through this difficult period uh, and flourish in the future to the benefit of the whole local community and hopefully generate more employment opportunities so punch the time just to conclude i would encourage the committee to to think think favorably um toward these applications support these businesses and and help them navigate um what are going to be extremely challenging trading conditions so it's been a five-year journey for me investing in 14 Liverpool Road. Um, and, and I know the guys behind me who've got the businesses have invested an awful lot of time and money and made an awful lot of sacrifice. And, and I hope that's acted as a bit of a catalyst to, to regenerate Pemberton. And, um, and I look forward to uh, that continuing in supporting the Pemberton Master Plan. Thank you. OK, um, impressive. Thank you, Warren. Um, did you say the tenant of the flat above is here to speak in favour? He is. Oh, OK. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Um, we have a Jacob Simpson. OK, Jacob, um, you have four minutes, OK? Good afternoon, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, all councillors. Uh, I'm Jacob Daniel Simpson. I live in flat 14C of Liverpool Road, as shown on the PowerPoint. 
I've been there since May 2022, so I've been there for quite a while now. And I know it seems really unorthodox for me to be here talking without a script, but that's because I'm going to be speaking just from what I've experienced every single day that I've been living there, which has been nothing but fantastic. I understand that the concern here with opening from 8 till 10 is noise, and I'm here to hopefully put that to bed because I've never experienced any issues with that. I work from home full time. I'm a game designer, and I also have pretty sensitive hearing. This hearing aid does the opposite of what most people want. Most hearing aids help you hear better. Mine basically helps tune noise down as I have a pulsatile tinnitus. And my office is directly above the craft and crust seating area and just basically across from the two gym bars. So not only can I not wear a headset, I have to at all times be hearing correctly. So obviously, yes, it was a bit of a huge concern moving in that towards the end of the night, I'd constantly be being disrupted. I can honestly say, and I wouldn't be here supporting it if I was going to like not say anything but the truth, that I've never heard anything. Um, the only time I've ever had a quote-unquote disruption was Pen With Them Live, one of the biggest outing events in Pen With Them, where everyone's playing bands, music's everywhere, and I was out in Pen With Them Live. So it was not a concern for me personally. My flat takes kind of like the brunt of all this, and on top of that, I completely understand the dire need to have it open. I know to a lot of people on the surface from being open outside from eight till 10 in summer might not seem like a lot, but I've been working in cocktail bars and bars just in general for most of my adult life um, before I took up self-employment. And speaking from experience, a lot of people, like typically young people and stuff like that, they only start drinking later in the night, especially in summer. And you can potentially take in from eight until 10, most the money you would take in in an afternoon. And as it was said previously, if you're forcing people on like a nice sunny day to go inside, they're not going to go inside. They're going to go down the road to somewhere else. They can sit out and enjoy the sunshine. We're in England. We don't get a lot of sunlight as it is. And as I was saying, with my self-employment, I usually work really late nights. I, I'm contracted with people in Queensland, Australia, and New Zealand. So a lot of my stuff and a lot of my meetings are from around eight o'clock onwards. And in summer, I have my window open because my office is like a sauna and I cannot hear people. I will, and that is the God's honest truth, as I was saying. And this is coming from someone who has incredibly acute sensitive hearing. And there's... That is basically what I wanted to say on the matter. Um, I don't want to waffle too much, but I'm in complete support of these businesses, especially after what I said before with all the COVID hit, of them being open for a longer time, and I'm in full support of it. Okay, Jacob, thanks for your eloquent presentation. Thanks very much for that. Okay, thank you. Right, we have um, a Philip. Ellery wishing to speak in favour, but it's going to be read out by a Chanel McKeon Ikari. Good evening, Chair. Dear committee members, unfortunately, I am able to unable to attend in person due to work commitments and the short notice given. However, I would like to share my thoughts on the application for the local establishments to allow trade until 10pm. I fully support these applications. As a resident living next door to Ginger Ale and Furrams, I have a window overlooking the outside area in question. I have no issue with them operating until 10pm and I have never had any problems with noise or disturbance from outside of these venues. It is relevant to note my partner has two young children and I would not want these disturbed. <clears throat> it is no secret that the person objecting has ongoing issues that are not a fault of the businesses and I feel this is reflected in some of the comments and lack of support from the council to approve such an application. I have witnessed significant custom leaving the premises after 8pm when the applicants must bring their seat inside. That must be a difficult position to put the business owners in when the atmosphere is nothing other than relaxed and civilised. That custom moves to other venues which have permission to operate later. I deem this unreasonable and it clearly must have an impact on these small family owned town centre businesses. <clears throat> it is my opinion the committee should allow the small businesses every opportunity to be successful as well as consistent with all other premises on the high street. Realistically, there is not a lot of time for these businesses to maximise out 
outside due to the weather and as respectable, friendly and approachable business owners, I do not see how any reasonable people will deem this to be an issue. Kind regards, Phil Ellery, 12A, Liverpool Road. Okay, thanks very much for that. Um, and now we have a Ryan Johnson, which is... Ah, sorry. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Ryan, you don't half look like Philip. <laughs> Oh, 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 okay. Um, four minutes on this one as well. Okay, no. thanks. To whom it may concern, I am writing as a resident and business owner within a small block of buildings next to the bars applying for outside hours to operate till 10pm. My flat is approximately 25 metres from outside the businesses applying for this condition. I live there with my partner and young son. I wholeheartedly support this application. The development and progress made in the area of the last few years due to these small businesses have without a doubt made pen with them a thriving town house prices book national trends because people want to be part of the environment and community that is being created there is no doubt that the family businesses investing in this area are what is causing this popularity some towns have businesses particularly in hospitality closing down at a faster rate than ever seen seen before as they continue to struggle from the covid pandemic and rising costs Surely, as a forward-thinking and proactive council, you would want to support this progress and help the businesses the most when their trade is strong, rather than effectively shutting them down early as trade moves to other venues in the area, whom I believe have had very similar vexatious comment complaints from a resident. Please do not lose sight of helping these businesses to survive because of one objection, which isn't necessarily a fair representation of the businesses and how they operate. I believe this application should be granted and the businesses should be allowed to try operating slightly later outside. I don't think it will cause significant problems. The council could even monitor this short term, which will give the businesses a chance to prove the impact it, it would have. Thank you for listening to my statement. Ryan Johnson, 10A, Liverpool Road. Okay, Chanel, well, well read out. Uh, thanks very much for those two presentations. And moving on now to... Councillors wanted to speak on the applica two applications. Councillor David Howarth, the ward member. Seeing as it's two applications, Councillor Howarth, do you need eight minutes? I don't we'll, need eight minutes. You but, um, you, you're allowed them, you know. I'm sure. <laughs> we're all friends here. <laughs> all okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm speaking as the ward councillor for Harrick and Priory in which both these premises reside, and with the local knowledge of both how, how these establishments are run and the type of clientele that they attract. This application is one of four identical applications uh, in the row of premises, so all of my comments are pertinent to all of those four applications. As has been pointed out, it is within the commercial district centre of Liverpool Road, as set out in the local plan, predating anything or anybody who is there now. It is the commercial centre. All of these premises were a part of the former Booth supermarket, which had storerooms converted to flats above in 2005, but continued to operate for a number of years after, with opening hours and associated evening activity until 10pm, uh, with piped music, which was a, a complaint of the same complainant then. It sat empty for some time, followed by the closure of the bank next door, and the whole area became a rundown eyesore. It was through the investment of both the freeholder and the businesses that it is now the most attractive part of the district centre. The recommendation for refusal is based on an assumption that noise and disturbance will be caused by patrons using the outside area, but without any evidence to support it or any previous evidence of disturbance or complaints from the police. I've certainly never received any complaints myself and I'm not aware of any other than the serial objector. And if there were, I would be the first to oppose this. The report states that neighbouring properties were notified with two letters received. Presumably these neighbouring properties were the flats above and perhaps the flats on either side and we've heard from all of the occupants bar one that they're in favour. Um, I last spoke on an application on this road premises a couple of years ago when the same objector opposed an amendment to the internal layout of the craft and crust on the grounds of noise which the committee rejected out of hand. Um, I raised that point because the objection was that he lived above what we call the VIP area at the very back of the premises. And if you look at the premises layout on the front of the report, that flat is at the very rear of the property 
and the objector would be the least likely to be affected, if at all. Those at the front, however, as has been uh, pointed out this evening, are in support. Environmental health argue that as the evening night time progresses, the background sound levels in the area will begin to drop off, which will exacerbate any intrusive patron noise due to the use of external seating. Yet Tesco, directly opposite, is open till 11. Why does it not exacerbate their noise? Even closer is a 24-hour petrol station facing the premises and the flats. Why does it not exacerbate their noise? Or the Indian takeaway next door, where people are coming and going all evening. Why does it not exacerbate their noise? Or the venue across the road open till 10 p.m., all of which receive planning permission in the face of objections. Or those coming past from other premises with much later opening hours, or waiting for buses. Why do only people sitting outside having a quiet drink exacerbate noise? The fact is, there is no evidence, and as has been pointed out in letters of support, the management in my experience would not want that type of clientele and would move them on. I certainly would not want to visit a premises with a rowdy atmosphere and would just leave. Unlike other establishments in the district centre, these premises do not require two black-suited doormen to vet customers going in. None of these premises have TV screens showing sport, have loud music or a drinks offer that would attract a clientele more likely to create noise and disturbance. They are real ale or cocktail bars, along with a, a restaurant attracting an older and more responsible customer or families out for a meal. In essence, people like me. All the applicants are asking for is parity with the rest of the district centre. I would contend, therefore, if the committee is not minded to approve, then at least give all of the applicants in the four premises an opportunity to prove themselves with an amendment to grant approval for a period of six months to then be reviewed. If these assumptions do not come to fruition, then the extended hours can be revoked, but I'm more than confident that there won't be any evidence of any disturbance. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Councillor Howarth. Um, just like to say, to just just because you get older, it doesn't make you any more responsible. Okay, that's from a personal point of view, obviously. Uh, Councillor Flannery. You're not used to things like this, Councillor Flannery. <laughs> Settle down, we're all friends. Thank okay. You. All right, you've got four minutes, Jay. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Committee, for hearing me tonight um, in this case. I, too, am a resident of this area, but I'm also an elected member, but also a business owner. Um, when, when I consider this report and see the recommendation, it's one of those examples where as when I was on the committee, we'd all sort of look around and say, is this a fair appreciation of the situation? You've heard the ward councillor speak, you've heard Warren Jacob, Phil Ryan and Chanel speak, and they articulated their position more than probably anyone can because they're obviously in and around that area and actually some of them living above um, the, the two applicants' spaces. I don't believe that the issue here about the detriment to the residential amenity. I also have frequented these places and that area on a regular basis. But I just want to make four, advance four points, please. We as a council are enablers. We're not the business owners. We're not the investors. You've heard from the investors. You've heard from the people who risk everything to put the money in to make these establishments what they are. It's our job to enable that. Um, and as a good council, we should do, because that's part of our mission statement. Also, the SMEs, let's get this clear, SMEs are the lifeblood of the communities. The SMEs we're talking about here all live in the area. They all pay council tax and they all pay rates. We need to get away from this idea that SMEs are something else. They're not big conglomerates, they're not Tesco's. They're just local people having a go and they've just come through one of the most challenging environments we've ever seen in our lifetime. Councillor Smith Adams, Councillor Aworth and I sat on the COVID recovery group. We heard testimony of this from plenty of small businesses and we heard how hard it's been for them to navigate through. We as a council supported them. The important is, thing now is what you've seen is innovation, Fair Haven, Ginger Ale. They're, they're actually, it's like a public service in some respects. 
people coming out of COVID themselves, mingling, getting together. What all they're asking for is an extension of that space. And we as a council need to consider that very seriously rather than see a report which says refusal. Um, it's been mentioned about a vacuum. I think when I've seen applicants applications here when I was on committee referred to outside space further down the road, there are, I think there's four other establishments which have this facility. We always said back then it's about fairness. It's about transparency. It's about supporting them all. So I don't see how we can give it to one without the other. Um, in terms of the the wider impact this is going to have, I think our fairness here stretches across the borough. There's nothing from highways. There's one plus one person complaining. The issue of residential, the issue about the residential community with the environmental health, I can I understand because we've got to comply. That's our job. But the testimonies you hear tonight are strong, they're valid, and I urge you all to support them. Um, what you've heard tonight is a number of local people, local SMEs, the people who have put the heart and soul into these businesses. And I've always said in the past, I know we have our policy to comply with, and rightly so, but we've got to put our residents at the forefront of most things and everything probably we do in terms of enabling them to succeed, to regenerate. You've heard one of the investors saying tonight he wants to be part of the wider investments in the master plan. That's refreshing to hear because you have a lot of people sort of not saying that. They're doing their bit. That was once upon a time a place which was left for a long time with no investment. It's now investment. And all they're asking is for a small part of our support and our help. So I urge you, all of you tonight, to support these applications and give them what they're, they, they are pleading for in terms of the applications. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your eloquence as usual, Councillor Flannery. Uh, uh, Councillor, right, we're opening both up to committee. There's one debate, but we have to do two separate so, votes. Sorry, sorry, we've got the applicants as well. If they want oh, to do the applicants want to speak? Yes? Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, thanks, Councillor Whelan, for reminding <laughs> me. Um, Michelle? You're speaking on behalf of Michelle, okay. Oh, you're Tia. Okay, Tia, you have four minutes. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, Councillors. I'm Tia mckernan Carey, Director of Ginger Ale, and I'm reading this statement on behalf of the, the applicant. We opened our business in December of 2019. It's a small family-run business started with the inheritance money from my late dad, whose dream it was to be to open a small bar. This never happened in his lifetime, so we've done it in his memory. Less than three months after opening, the COVID pandemic hit. On the road to recovery, we then faced the cost of living crisis, so it's been a roller coaster for years, to say the least. We deliver an excellent service to our loyal customers and feel we had a very personal touch being completely family run. Our main customer base is the over 35s, with our oldest regular being 85 years young. We know most customers by name and the elderly in particular use our bar as a social space to combat loneliness. Many new friendships have been made within our four walls and even relationships formed. We're known as many as the bar with heart. Unfortunately, <clears throat> since opening, we have suffered numerous complaints from one household out of three residential properties above. I do believe the picture on the presentation may have been a bit misleading as the complainant's residence is set further back than the people that we've heard in support. And I would stress that the property being approximately 30 metres back from our outdoor seating and neither of the two that are directly above, both of whom fully support this application as we've heard tonight. We have addressed all complaints and mitigated any issues. We've had one objection to our application from the entire area and it's from the same repeat complainant we've been dealing with for four years. Surely it's suggesting a vexatious element to the complaints. The present restriction forces us to ask customers to move inside at 8 pm on a warm summer's evening. Not only is this frankly embarrassing, it also makes sorry, it also makes a massive impact on our trade as most customers then walk a few hundred meters down the road to other venues to continue socializing outdoors. These venues who have outdoor use until 10 pm have similar planning issues but one on appeal. We will also appeal if our application is refused. The said venues also have residential neighbours either above, adjacent or behind. 
I appeal to any business owners on the committee to envisage losing customers on a daily basis to other businesses that do not have the same strict conditions imposed. The word consistency is used a lot in committee meetings, yet there is no consistency from venue to venue along the same Pemberton District High Street. The plans for Pemberton are for it to become a place to go with a cafe bar culture similar to Lytham, bringing revenue and new people to the area, but in our case, only until 8pm outdoors. With COVID still pre- sorry, prevalent, the preference for outdoor socialising, especially amongst the elderly, is most definitely still there. We need the revenue from our summer months to carry us through the hard winter months. In effect, refusal of this application could potentially see the closure of small independent businesses at the end of Liverpool Road with the strictest conditions, leading to the loss of livelihoods, jobs and revenue to the area. The recommendation to refuse is based purely on assumption with no factual or supportive evidence. Could I also ask the committee to take into account that outside seating will potentially only be used for a small number of months of the year dictated by the Great British Summer? I implore the committee to approve this application, even with a trial basis condition, with only evidential complaints taken into account. We've built a lovely little social hub for Pemberton to be proud of. Please allow us, sorry, please do not allow one serial complainant to take this away and instead heed all the positives our little bar brings to the area. Thank you all for your time. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Tia. Um, Liam from Furham Gin, if you'd like to come forward. I'm sorry about that. I've forgotten all about the applicant. Um, hi. Okay, Liam, hi. Good evening to you all. Uh, my name is Liam Stempson and I'm co-founder and distiller of Fairroom Distillery, which operates Fairroom's craft bar on Liverpool Road. Since opening our small craft bar of May this year, we were surprised to see strict conditions apply to our change of use planning approval, which instantly puts us on the back foot in comparison to other establishments on Liverpool Road, e.g. no live, m live m music or outdoor seating past 8pm. We were extremely fortunate to have great weather during our opening month of May, but this quickly turned into anxiety when we had to inform customers each evening they must come inside or move off as our outdoor area was closing. The embarrassment is profound with many customers understanding but would move into other bars to continue their evening in the sun, wouldn't you? It is extremely saddening to see customers walking away and not being allowed to enjoy themselves at our bar. Our bar that we've worked so hard to create a, a great space for people to come and enjoy. As time went on, we started to notice customers were getting used to this curfew and our footfall would decrease way before 8pm, causing even more significant harm to our daily turnover. And as a small venue, we must work hard to attract customers and have our slice of the custom available on Liverpool Road. And with the cost of living crisis ever more prevalent, the odds are somewhat against us in these uncertain times, including the cost of sale, which has increased throughout the year, and especially since August 1st with the spirit duty increase. We need all the support we can get and the council to level the playing field and make it fair for all businesses. The additional two hours of outdoor seating in the evening adds up to about 10 hours a week. This will give us the boost our small business can benefit from. We have a great customer base in Pemberton uh, that have followed us since day one of launching our entire business in 2021 and have welcomed and supported us on Liverpool Road with our first public pre premise. We cater to a wide array of age ranges and groups from families to couples who are all respectful when visiting us and that you'll find that most of our customers are local residents who respect the area in which they live. It is in our best interest to ensure we don't create a bad name for ourselves and we strongly encourage a civilised drinking establishment and since opening we have never had any trouble or found customers to be loud or rowdy inside or out. I would like to make it clear that just, the, just like our indoor seating, our outdoor area is small too and realistically the outdoor seating will only be used properly during the summer months which is only around 4 out of the 12 dependent on the weather of course. You have heard from local residents who actually reside directly above and face onto Liverpool Road and who support this application, yet the one resident whose property is sat set way back and faces to the car park of the rear of the block objects. The grounds on which the recommended refu refusal is based on is redundant and carries no actual evidence and is based on assumptions only. What is not an assumption is a loss of trade that we have faced during this year alone, and September and October have been really hard months, and it's obvious to us now as new bar operators that we heavily rely on summer months to be amazing to carry us through. We need all the custom we can get and putting our conditions in line with other bars along Liverpool Road will massively help. 
I urge you to approve our application and make a fair playing field for all. Uh, and it is as as it's met, as it's mentioned, our property resides within the business district of Pemberton, and we will be happy with a trial basis to prove that our bar will not cause any nuisance to neighbouring residents. And I want to make it known that should our application be refused, we will have no alternative but to appeal, which will incur further cost and time. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Liam. Uh, right, Dave, can I now open to committee? Yes, Chair. <laughs> the, the, the one thing I was going to say, if anyone proposes anything, could you make it clear whether you're proposing it for both applications? To try and make it, we're going to have to take two separate votes, of course, but the issues are largely common to both. So I think we can have the one debate, but then two separate votes. Okay. Uh, Councillor Williamson, you've indicated you want to come in. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, some, of, some of you may or may not be aware, I used to run a, 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 a business that was perhaps connected to the sort of licensed trade, so I know firsthand what businesses have gone through through COVID, through the recovery and, and, the, re and the rest of it. Um, this area has been regenerated significantly. Uh, there's a lot, you know, there's been a lot of money being spent. There's been massive improvements to it, and it's quite true that town centre usages are changing over time. It is now becoming a more of a more of a nighttime economy, and especially with this area of Penwitham, is has improved markedly with, with these this particular type of premise, this type, this type, this this type of premises and, and the type of action that's been that's been taken here. That said, um, you know there is is acknowledged that there is a, a noise and that there, there, could, there could be some uh, detrimental detrimental immunity. But um, it's acknowledged that I think the speakers have been very very eloquent tonight in what they've said. There's overwhelming support for this now. Also, this is the planning aspect to it, and what has been mentioned in the committee report is that the premises license actually matches the planning. And, and a premises license would also put restrictions on as well. So um, they've still got to fight that battle yet. They've still got to get an extended premises license, and this is only the this is only the first part. This is only the first part of it. Now, I was because of the the concerns around noise and whatever. I was thinking, you know, shall they, instead of going to refuse, just do an amendment, shall we to restrict the hours of opening to say something like beginning of May and September, but. Because what I've heard tonight through all the support and everything else, I don't think we should even bother with that. I think we should just should just get on and approve and let these businesses trade properly and maxim, maxim, let them maximise their their premises and have parity with everybody else and bang with them. So for both proposals, I propose approval. So you're proposing an amendment. I'm proposing an amendment officer to, recommendation. To, against officer recommendation to approve both applications. Both applications. OK, thank you, Councillor Williams. Councillor Adams, you, you said you wanted to speak. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think everyone who spoke tonight spoke, spoke really well and it was quite clear that the passion um that you all have uh, you've all got different types of interest um but i think it, what particularly was fairly powerful was the the fact that we had residents of the uh, of the flats above come to to support so i mean for me this is fairly straightforward um there's this is a district center as we've heard um fundamentally we in my mind we cannot allow one objector to stifle our local economy um, and prevent these small businesses from um, developing and progressing and, and contributing to that economy uh, in many different ways, jobs uh, and others. You know, it, it it's amazing where Penwitham or 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 some of um, people my age and younger would refer to it as the strip. Um, it, you know, you go up there on a on a weekday or or of a weekend. Um, and it's thriving, uh, and there's people from outside of the borough that are coming to Pen with them for that very reason. Um, and it will be absolute madness in my mind to do anything other than um, to approve this tonight. And I think we, you know, we, we've spoken about the struggles that SMEs have gone through, uh, and will continue to go through. And I think it's our responsibility um, to support them. We obviously have to to be aware of the effect that it has on 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 residents or residential amenity. But for me, the, the pros to this far outweigh the negatives. And 
there has been quite a few words said about fairness and consistency. Um, and I think that's very important because we value all businesses, um, not just in, in Pemberton, but all over the borough. And we need to be consistent as a, as a planning authority um, to make sure that we support them all equally. And I think that's important. So um, thank you for, for coming tonight and saying the things that you did because you made my decision quite easy being uh, and honest. So I'm very happy to and proud to second approval chair on both applications. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Adams. I have Councillor Stringfellow, you wish to come in? Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd just like to say thanks to everybody to come and talk because that really has helped make a decision. Um, I think it's important that we support the local community and the businesses. And um, I think it's also important that we're seen to do that. And I think you've all spoken really well. And I'm very proud to... Um, to say that I would like to approve your, I don't know which way around it goes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I'm backing it up. Okay. Okay, thanks, Councillor Springfellow. Councillor Green. Yeah, I too thank everyone that's come because it's been quite enlightening. We don't often hear people who live in the vicinity of an application that that's so keen to have it go ahead normally it's the other way around so it's quite refreshing this evening to hear everyone that was for it just one thing i wanted to ask was more of a question than a statement really you know on these um establishment drinking establishments they have like skips and things where they get rid of the bottles and the glass at the end of the evening and everything i'm presuming the glasses from the outside area will be disposed where the inside area disposes because if you have another one at the front for that, it that would be noisy even after 10 o'clock because it would be tidying up and getting rid of. It's just a question as to whether that is a condition that is put on that. I, I would imagine, Councillor Green, both establishments yeah. have the last collector's staff Thank you. who collect the glasses. Yeah. 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 Lovely, thank you. Counting actually going to be disposed of in front with a separate skip or anything. Right, okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. I also support um, uh, the proposal and second uh, today on um, this evening on, on both applications. Uh, I mean, the, the, the word of SME is more... Uh, <clears throat> has been used quite a bit tonight and you know we should all support it and we do uh there's no doubt about that and and to be quite honest all those years ago when you know the economic development department of this council by the planning was supporting the local plan and supporting the building of uh penworth and bypass and the regeneration of penworth itself this is exactly the sort of thing that we were looking for that this was the vision all those years ago and it's nice to see it come into fruition so um uh, there's, there's there's a bit a lot of work to do yet in Penwithan, but it's uh, it's on its way there and there are people there who want to invest and want to be part of the community thank you chair yeah um thank you Sorry. councillor smith <laughs> I, i'm being rudely interrupted <laughs> uh janice you want to come in on um the point yeah, if if these two applications are approved this evening, because the variation of condition applications, we would reimpose all the conditions that were originally imposed when they got permission to change use. So there are a number of conditions that will go on with just the relevant ones, nine and ten for the ginger ale and nine for the firm's gin, that would be the wording would be amended to reflect the new times but all the other conditions will be reimposed because there are variation of condition application so effectively it's reissuing the decision notice just wanted to clarify that clear as good janice to me <laughs> uh go on warren i'll allow it i don't usually but go on no just come forward i can't hear you from there I don't know whether that means that there are restrictions being reinstated that have previously been waived. Could you try and bring that to life for the benefit of the businesses sat behind me and myself? 
I'll, I'll bring our legal expert in on that one, Dave. I think all that's been said is that obviously the two applications here are to vary conditions. All the existing conditions will remain. So just the, the, but the conditions that you've applied for, they will be varied. So in effect, you'll get a new permission or a new permission will be issued if members vote this way with the existing position uh, p conditions on subject to these variations. Is that clear? Yeah, all the all the other conditions. I mean, assuming you're okay with them because you haven't applied to vary them. Yeah, yeah. Am I okay now? Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Mullinor, and then I'm going to ask if we have any other proposals because I'm going to tie up the debate. Councillor Mullinor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think everything's been said this evening. Um, the local residents and the businesses of uh, done a really good job of uh, certainly convincing me this evening that uh, um, they're in a good place and um, it would benefit Pemberton overall in this case. So uh, I'm quite happy to go along with the uh, proposal in second uh, with conditions. Thank you. OK, thanks, Councillor Mullen. All right. Do I have any other proposals? Nope. OK, so for Ginger Ale, this is voting on the amendment from refusal to approval can we have a show of hands now please yeah. yes sure that's gone through unanimously so the uh, the conditions in question will be varied okay thanks for that and the same for fair um, gin do we have any other no nope, yeah okay fair um, gin dave Again, Chair, that's gone through unanimously, so the condition in question will be varied as applied for. Good news. Uh, congratulations. And if you were just here for those two applications, I'd get to the gym bar if I were you. All right, thanks for attending this evening. You were really, really impressive. About that, it's all right. Um, while we're clearing the room, ladies and gentlemen, if any of you want a comfort break, now would be the ideal time. We'll be moving on to Hull Village Memorial Hall, 94 Liverpool Old Road, Much Hull next.
Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're all back, um, nice and refreshed. Um, let's move on to Hool Village Memorial Hall, 94 Liverpool Old Road, much Hool. Uh, Janice, if you would like to present this item, please. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so, the application relates to the Memorial Hall in Much Hool and specifically to the tennis courts to locate it to the rear of the Bowling Green and the Village Hall buildings. So, the application proposes the change of use of the tennis courts to form a new multi-use games area, or mugger as they're more commonly known, uh, to provide for tennis, netball and five-a-side football, with new fencing around, floodlights, and also proposes a new pavilion building and car parking area. The existing pavilions to be demolished and spectator seating <coughs> provided. So this is the existing pavilion building between the tennis courts and bowling green, which will be demolished. Um, this is just a view of, view of it from the tennis court side. And then this one's a view from the bowling green side. So the proposed pavilion building will provide a bowling green viewing room, changing rooms, WCs and storage. And this is just a view of what, what it's proposed to look like. So this is a view of the existing <coughs> tennis courts, which are to be replaced with the mugger. Um, and this is the existing fencing around. So the mugger will include one tennis stroke netball court and a five-a-side football pitch. So this just shows what's proposed. Um, a new three metre high well mesh fencing with ball stop netting above, also three metre high, will be around the proposed mugger. And 6.2 metre high floodlights will be located in each corner and in the centre of, the, of three sides. So residential properties are located to both the western and eastern boundaries of the Memorial Hall site. So this shows properties on Thornfield and the common boundary. And these are to the west on Westcroft. This aerial view demonstrates the proximity of residential properties to the tennis courts. So environmental health were consulted and advised that the introduction of a mugger represents a significant intensification of use resulting in disseminated to neighbouring residents. So as such, they'd require a number of conditions to restrict the hours of use of the mugger. <clears throat> However, the main issue is that the proposal involves the loss of three tennis courts and no robust needs assessment has been provided in line with Sport England's Assessing Needs and Opportunities Guidance to justify the loss or to demonstrate the strategic and sporting need for the proposed sports facilities. This, this also needs to be informed by the Central Lancashire Playing Pitch Strategy 2018, which is the latest one. In view of this, Sport England have objected, setting out clearly what the applicant must provide to satisfy their objection. Despite providing four responses in total to the various submitted additional details, Sport England advised that they maintain their objection and as such the proposal is considered to be contrary to policy G7 criteria A and the application is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Janice. Thank you. Uh, right, we don't have any members of the public wishing to speak in objection to this application. Uh, but we do have three members of the public who want to speak in support of the application. We have um, a Howard Davidson, please. OK, Howard, if you come to the desk, press the speak button and give us your presentation. You have four minutes, OK? Thank you for this opportunity, Chairman. 
My name is Howard Davidson. I'm the chairman of Hull Village Hall Trustees. In view of the technical objections, Support England has asked the council to consider determining this application application after having regard to the views of the consultees and planning policy. You are now therefore the decision makers. Let me make it clear, I speak from a heart on this application and not the textbook. The technicalities will be addressed by others. We therefore make a plea to allow local demand and enthusiasm to outweigh Sport England's objections. We as trustees of Hull Village Hall have a proven track record of achieving the seemingly impossible. We have the ability and experience to reduce mountains to molehills. We have been at this for some 20 years. Remember, change is not a destination, it is but a journey, and we are on that journey. This change is en enhancing local sporting activities, and it is part of that long journey. We have, over the years, developed, encouraged and courted local benefactors who have faith in our ability to provide positive outcomes. Please do, do not deny us this opportunity to en enhance people's lives and promote that bedrock of society, community cohesion. I would ask you to favourably view this application and uh, allow it to pass. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Howard. Um, we have a Mr. Alan Taylor, please. Good evening, Alan. Uh, if you press the speak button, that's the one. Uh, you Got have four minutes to make your presentations. Uh, thanks. Well, my name's Alan Taylor. And I'm a, uh, a parish councillor and I'm the parish council's re representative on the uh, village hall committee. Uh, I've been a parish councillor for about 10 or 11 years now. And the reason that, that I joined the parish council was specifically to get the new village hall built and get the m amenities done behind it as well. And um, what we're trying to do is to um, do things for the local community. The, the village hall at the moment uh, caters for young people and old people because we've got the bowling club, which is mainly old people. And we've got uh, in the uh, village hall itself, we've got the toddlers groups and stuff like that. But we don't seem to have anything really good for, for, the, for the middle groups. Uh, I'm talking about the kids who want to play football, and uh, I know we've got the uh, the wreck the with the, the 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 field and uh, football field, but it's wet through half the time, and uh, nobody really plays on it in winter much, uh, not for practicing and that. So we really need to get something for the for the kids, and especially since the uh, ladies' football team did very well the other year, we've got loads and loads of young ladies wanting to play football, including my own granddaughter, who's about six or seven, she's nuts on it, and. Uh, there's loads of kids like that. Now, what's happening now is that the, the parents have to take them into other, other areas. And in wintertime, it's just not as easy. And uh, so I've, I've, been, I've lived in Hull for, uh, well, since 1949. That makes me 74. <laughs> and uh, so I know it inside out. I know the people. And we've carried them with us all the way to get to where we are now. So like Howard, I, I really want you to let this through and then we can really get stuck in and get some money. We're not here asking for money. We just want to be able to get this thing going and then we'll get some money. I mean, when we built the village hall, we, we financed that 80% ourselves and it was a lot of money. And um, so I know we can do it. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, Alan, thanks very much for that. Um, do we have a close up? Good evening, Claire. OK, uh, you have four minutes. OK, good evening. Uh, my name is Claire Sutton. I am trustee of Hull Village Memorial Hall leading the Mugger project. This planning application is to provide 
a five-a-side 3G football pitch and build a new tennis court which can be shared with netball. Tennis has not been played at Hull regularly since the tennis club closed about seven years ago after a long decline. A record of tennis use over the last summer months has shown no use. The inspections were made at random times and dates and recorded so. Anecdotal evidence suggests one court is used occasionally. Consultations have taken place, firstly with the July 2021 South Ribbleborough Council questionnaire, which showed a 60% preference of upgrading the tennis courts to a multi-use games area. Secondly, an online community survey conducted in September 2021 showed a preference for five-a-side football, football training, tennis and netball, with the football options being most popular. And thirdly, at all Village Hall events, the trustees have a stall informing people of the proposed development. We find our neighbours and our community has shown full support with no objections raised. We also have letters of support from the local school and the local junior football clubs such as Lancon Girls and New Longton Rovers who are excited to use our facility as they struggle finding 3G venues. The existing tennis courts are in need of resurfacing, new nets, fence repair, as well as flood lighting and new changing facilities. But there is no appetite from the residents, members of the village hall or the trustees to spend any money to repair the existing tennis courts when they are unlikely to be used. The existing courts will therefore fall further into disrepair. Sport England have said we have not justified reducing the three courts to one court with a five-a-side football pitch and a netball facility. We have made two attempts to do this, citing all the above consultations. We are told that there are specialist consultants, who are very expensive, who could provide a justification which follows their 101-page guidance. We are a charity and we have no wish to spend large sums of money to justify what we feel is obvious. In relation to funding, we can only really start getting the money together once the planning permission is granted. We do have about £50,000 of money ready to, to do this, which will encourage more funding to be forthcoming. In conclusion... Our motivation is to provide a good sporting venue which will cater for a variety of sports to encourage more people to play sport. Benefits of sport and especially team sports increases positive mental health, physical health and reduces social isolation in all sectors of the community. The alternative is that the tennis courts will continue to degrade and will eventually become a car park, which will be of little benefit to our community and will be a completely wasted opportunity. Thank you. OK, thanks for your presentation, Claire. Uh, right, OK, we have the ward member, Councillor Connor Watson. Good evening, Con uh, Councillor Watson. Sorry. You're amongst friends. I've, uh, I've not heard you speak publicly before, so just take it easy. Deep breaths. Okay, you have four minutes, Con Councillor Thank Watson. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman and members of the Planning Committee. You'll be glad to hear that I intend to be brief. I have great respect for our planning officers and the work they do. It may be that they are as glad they aren't councillors as I am glad I'm not a planning officer. I suspect all can agree that both roles are at times thankless tasks. I'd rather not disagree with their recommendation, but I'm afraid this time I will have to. I ask the members of the committee to approve this application. 
You will have read the detailed reasons and evidence provided, so I hope you have come to the same conclusion that I have in that. The proposed redevelopment of an existing tennis court to a multi-use games area can only have positive impacts on the area. The main benefit being an inevitable increase of use of a resource for the health and well-being of the recipients of rule and the surrounding area. By moving to a variety of sports and more popular ones that current facilities elsewhere are strained to provide, it means more people exercising with all the physical and mental health benefits that brings. It will also not be lost to anyone here that when facilities become run down, it has an effect beyond the sad sight. A new and well-maintained facility provides extra pride in the community. The reasons for refusal are heavily weighted on Sports England's comments, but upon looking at these, you will see this is really a desire of an organisation to stick rigidly to bureaucracy and a box ticking in a one-size-fits-all fashion. When, as we all know, one size never fits all. All the dedicated work of the trustees, another thankless task, so I'll thank them now, um, provide what the community wants has come against excessive demands for information to be provided in a very particular fashion. And rather than waste time, much better spent acting on local issues and money hiring experts and collating and organising data, which could be much better spent locally on improved sports um, facilities. A detached national body wants to make it too hard for a small local organisation to do what we all know is best for the community. I hope you can therefore support this excellent application for a fantastic facility tonight. Thank you for your attention. Uh, congratulations, Councillor Watson. Wonderful to hear from you. It's great when a ward councillor actually speaks up in support of his residents. Well done. Thank you. OK, we have the agent with us this evening, uh, Richard Bramley. Chairman, uh, councillors and officers, uh, I'm Richard Bramley. I am Bramley Patent Partners Architects from Bamber Bridge, uh, but, and I'm the agent for this application, but I actually live in Hull and have done most of my life. Neither we nor the applicants have any problems with your officers who have been supportive and helpful throughout this process. Indeed, all the straightforward planning matters have been resolved and the applicants are happy to accept conditions covering hours of use, boundary fencing, flood lighting design. The only reason that this matter is before you at all is that in spite of considerable but volunteer efforts of the Village Hall Committee, we have been enabled to satisfy the requirements of Sport England in proving proving, mind you, that the tennis courts are largely unused and that a, a, a multi-use games area uh, and one tennis court on the existing area is, is, is a good thing. We suggest that to expect the Village Hall Committee to produce, and I quote here from Sport England, robust needs assessment using Sport England's assessing needs and opportunities guidance to justify the loss of three tennis courts and to demonstrate the strategic and sporting need of the proposed sports facility to a greater extent than has been done. Bearing in mind we are trying to prove a negative here, never easy. I argue that this is unreasonable, bearing in mind the relatively modest uh, scale of the proposed development. On the face of it, this would appear to be a sensible use of a site, bearing in mind the considerable public support. But in our direct experience, Sport England have form for being somewhat overzealous with their objections. Uh, I do loads of jobs for schools. And St. Aidan's Church of England High School was the only large secondary school in Lancashire not to have a proper sports hall. It only had a gym and an old one at that. 
In 2021, we managed to put together a funding package from mostly from the DfE of over one and a half million pounds for a new sports hall. But when we applied for planning permission, Sport England objected on the grounds that we were proposing to build it on an existing playing field, even though no pitches were lost. Where else is a, a secondary school going to build a building the size of a sports hall? For four months, this application was held up by this ob objection, and it was only overcome by the work and good offices of the head of sport at the school, one John Armfield, who's a very accomplished sportsman in his own right, and he's also the son of Jimmy Armfield, who was a, a, a very excellent football player and manager, now just dead recently. Without um, he had enough specialist knowledge and skill and knew enough helpful people um, to get support and with the support of Wire Borough Council, considerable support, the, the, the objection was eventually lifted. 21 pages, and I've got them here, of objections from Sport England for this thing. If, over the time, he was enormously disappointed with their unhelpful attitude, and without this, and without his and Wireborough Council's support, 860 children would have continued to be deprived of top quality sporting opportunities. We understand that Sport England has a remit to consider applications relating to sports facilities and accept that they, that they have considerable expertise in these matters. However, this is a modest proposal to make an existing area more versatile so that it can be used for more sections of the community. We all have to operate at a local level rather than at elite sports level. Yeah. And Richard, we Richard, yep. you need to start tying no up. No problem. Now. And we consider that it's important to remember a quotation actually attributed to Voltaire that the perfect is the enemy of the good. This is a good proposal with the benefit of considerable public support, which only recommend, which is only recommended for refusal due to the, in my opinion, overzealous objections from Sport England. And we recommend it to the planning committee for approval. Thank you very much. OK, thank, thank you for, for your presentation, Richard. Firstly, I'm going to bring uh david and then i want to bring catherine in before i open this up to committee dave yes sure i mean the only thing i wanted to say obviously um uh, catherine will be commenting on the sports england issue the only thing i want to say if members are man minded to approve the uh, uh, approve this application tonight obviously we don't have any conditions set up because it's down for refusal so uh, what we'd normally have done in the past then if the if members are in favor is to um, for them to make an in-principle approval and for the final decision to be delegated to head of planning and yourself in terms of finalising the conditions. So if, if if that's the way the debate goes, just to bear that in mind. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, Catherine, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, well, I've been asked to speak on this item because obviously officers have been working very hard to try and bring this application before members with a recommendation for approval. Um, and we've liaised on, on numerous occasions with the applicant and Sport England. Um, and we've heard obviously from the agent and from the ward councillor and from members of the, uh, the, the Village Hall Trust about why they feel that this scheme would be a good scheme for the village. And certainly we wanted to bring it before members to get an understanding if members were, were of a similar view. But if members are of that view, we still feel that there are matters that Sport England have raised that actually need to be resolved before this committee could perhaps comfortably reach a conclusion that it is acceptable. Certainly, they've made comments not just about the principle of development and having to generally identify that there is a need for that, but there's also other comments that have been made about the materials for the pictures, making sure they're suitable for the uses that are proposed, the layout of the changing room in terms of some safeguarding and privacy issues and perhaps little things that can be improved with the application. So I think what we've really done is brought it before members to seek a general view. But our recommendation perhaps would be if members do feel that they would like to be supportive of the application, that really we would still recommend that, that perhaps we seek further to try and address some of the concerns of Sport England. And 
And I know uh, the, app, the agent has suggested it's a very expensive process to do that, but there certainly are planning consultants out there that might be able to assist with that work. And I can't imagine in the grand scheme of the cost of the project that the cost of securing that level of support w would probably be prohibitive. Deb. Yeah, sorry, through you, Chair. So one possible, it's not for me to influence the debate, of course, but based on what Catherine has said, one possible, one possible decision tonight would be to defer the, the decision to allow uh, the applicant more time to um, satisfy the requirements of Sports England if you are generally in favour of the application. That's one, one um, decision you could make. And, OK, just before I open up to committee, um, Sport England are to statutory council T, are they? Um, obviously, we've had to consult them, but what they're saying in terms of that is that if this is not the type of application where if Sport England object, we need to refer it to the Secretary of State for decision. So we would be entitled to make the decision on the application. Thanks, Catherine. OK, I'm going to open up to committee. I have Councillor Adams, Councillor Green, Councillor Mullinor, Councillor Williams, Councillor Shaw. In that order, please. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I think, again, thank you for, for coming and, and talking to us. It's um, it's always really helpful and it, it helps us make a decision on the night, I think. And obviously with the, the evidence in front of us, it does seem to me that this is a technicality issue. I don't I, for me, this it would be of great benefit to, to the whole community um, to see a facility uh, such as this um, reside there. I think you know, we all know that we've got health challenges and, and I think as a council we would like to see more spaces where people can be active in, in whatever um, sport or, or activity that they're doing. I think this provides that. So I think that there is an element here of us um, needing to support that. I think the, you know, the, the, the success of the um, the Village Hall, I think, is, is, has been seen for for. Um, quite a lot of people, um, not just in Hull, but also outside, and the success of that is is welcomed again for for our community in South Ribble. Um, but it is a, a you know a, a level of frustration for me that there's a technicality issue, which is why we, why refusal has been recommended, and that's not me blaming officers at all. I think we've kind of been forced into this position um, more than anything. Um, I don't know how it, it would be best. I know that Dave's come in and said that. Should we defer or should we approve and then allow the uh, chair and head of planning to, to kind of um, decide on the conditions? Um, I'm not sure what would be best to do. Um, I think in my mind, I would want to, to kind of go with whichever is best to get this completed uh, and to get this um, in in place and make sure that it's right and it, it you know it, it passes all the the rules and regs that we need uh, for for buildings and, and development such as this. So I'm not kind of sure how we do it or how, what the best way to do it. I'm I'm kind of probably open to to officers on that, but I will wholeheartedly support this in in some form to make sure that it, it becomes a success and it and it it's you know and I can visit it in a, in a few years time playing football hopefully. Thank you. In a few years' time, Councillor Adams, you'll be too old to play football. <laughs> Any, anywho, um, was that a proposal for approval with consultation between me and Head of Planning, or was it uh, well, was it a proposal for deferral, or or are you unsure? It, but, but yeah, it wasn't, it was, wasn't anything really, Chair, which I know isn't helpful, but I think I'd, maybe I just want to seek guidance from officers, or maybe Catherine, in terms of what her recommendation is, I know she can't influence debate, but what her recommendation is in terms of if if the committee is is in favour of this, which I hope we will be, what is the best way forward in terms of making it a reality? Is this Catherine or is it Dave? Catherine. Thank you, Chair. My advice would be it's important to try and resolve the objections and to get some clarity on the things that we're unsure about at the current time. So my advice would be if members are generally supportive of the scheme, I would recommend a deferral to allow us to continue to negotiate to resolve the outstanding issues. Thank you, Chair. Um, there wouldn't be, if we did defer, there's no, is there a time constraint on this? There's not a time constraint. We'd work with the agent to see if we can bring it back as soon as possible. Does that help, Councillor Adams? 
there's no time constraints on it, so it won't be non-determination or anything like that. Okay, I'm 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 willing to listen to the rest of uh, comments from the committee. Sorry, Chair, I wasn't clear on what you were asking me. We would have to agree an extension of time with with the agent in order to complete the negotiations. Okay, so we come to an arrangement with the agent for an extension. <laughs> What I want to make sure is that we are not accused of non-determination and it goes straight to appeal. Do I, is, that, is that okay? Do it, yeah. Obviously, we can only agree an extension of time in cooperation with the agents and we've not requested an extension of time beyond what's shown on your agenda. Now, the agents obviously could make the decision to go to appeal if we haven't agreed an extension of time. So there is always that possibility. But were the agent to go to appeal and still have an outstanding objection from Sport England, it's likely that the inspectorate would be taking a similar view to ourselves, that it would be difficult to make a favourable decision. Yeah, all right. All right, thanks, Catherine. Your wisdom is very much appreciated. Yeah. Councillor Green. Yeah, I'd just like to, to thank everyone that's come and spoken on this and I can see that it's a very forward-thinking um, committee that deals with this village hall and I'd love to see it all come to fruition and I think it would be a marvellous um, facility. But I think there's still a lot of things that are up in the air. Um, obviously, Sports England... They obviously want sport to go ahead and, and and I would think that the fact that they're objecting or they're, they're putting um, objections up is that they must have some worries, some concerns on this um, facility it, that we may not even know about, such as, you know, health and safety or, you know, things like that. Um, I think it's a good idea that you're using some of the tennis area, you're keeping some of the tennis, which is a summer sport and may come back. I think the fact that football is coming more popular because I think it's more popular on the television, especially with the w women's football coming online uh, and everything. So I think it's quite a good application to have some football, some netball, some tennis. I think it's quite a good varied um, venue. I am concerned about the flood lighting being near the properties, what sort of flood lighting is going in, and the fact that it's on till 10 o'clock, which may well be a bit late for the local residents because um, you've got the bouncing of the balls and the shouting and what have you, the natural excitement when people are playing games. So I'm concerned with those, and that's what I'm meaning. The conditions aren't tidying yet with flood lighting and times sports england perhaps have health and safety reasons i don't know there's quite a few things up in the air with this and as much as i'm all for it and i'm all for the encouraging young people especially into sport for the health and, and the mental well-being and everything and i'm all for it i still feel at this moment in time there are still quite a few answers that need addressing um you know through us so i i would like to go and propose deferment like uh, mr whelan suggested that way it will give us a short time to get more information perhaps more information can come from the committee more information from sports england and in the end we could end up with a better a, a better um result in this and better facilities thank you Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Green. So you you, you are pre proposing deferral. Okay, Councillor Mullineau. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I don't feel we're in a position where we want to turn this down at all. I think it's good for the local area. A lot of work's gone on already. It must be frustrating at times, um, you know, with, with, with Sports England wanting certain things and that, but I, I do think it's important that we make sure we've got conditions in place that satisfy everyone. Um, that there may be certain things that they want that we don't need to give or that we don't, we don't have to give. Um, but I would still like them to at least have the opportunity to say what they think's right and what's what's not right. Um, for that reason, I think we should go for deferral. So I was second 
Councillor Green's um, deferral. Okay, thanks, Councillor Mullinor. Councillor Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I think the speakers have speak, spoken very, very eloquently about the need and uh, the actual facility. I, I have no doubt that the facility is required and is needed and everybody wants it. Um, the thing about a, a robust needs assessment from an office, granted it's Sport England, they, they know about sport, they're, they're effectively over, over sport in this country, but there's nothing better than local knowledge and local and, and local need. And if that's what the locals say they want and that's what they need, then that's what they should get. Saying that, you know, you know, saying so saying that, if you're looking at the things that, that are outstanding from um sport English and a local needs assessment and things like that, I'm inclined more to be to not say ignore it, but take less less weight in it. What gets me with with this is is the actual design the actual design because Nowhere is it specified in there. It says that the location of the pylons are actually inside the playing area. It also says that there's there's no specification of what the actual surface itself will be. So whilst it's a brilliant proposal, what has got to be there has got to be fit for purpose. And it's not been demonstrated that it's fit for purpose. And I think that side of it could be tidied up very, very quickly. That side of it, and there's a bit about the safeguarding issues as well and changing rooms, a, a quick design tweak on, on a pavilion to for that type of thing, that type of thing could be solved. So if this came back, if it was deferred and this came back with those particular elements fixed, <clears throat> then I think, I think I personally would look a lot more favourably on it. But I think deferral is the right answer to get those small technical things out of the way because I would much rather rely on what you say as residents and the users of it than what Sport England say. And I think that's, I would go along with you for that reason, if you tidy that bit up. Thanks, Councillor Williams. Councillor Shaw. Thank you, Chair. I was, um, I was a little surprised when I saw the, the report um, and I felt, very, I, 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 my background was as a civil servant, so I thought paperwork's really important. We ask a question for a good reason, and we don't always explain fully, properly why we've got that reason. We just don't share the reason. We just say, "Give us the paperwork." And I thought this is a stupid situation where we've got some bureaucratic situation that needs to be resolved. When Richard came up and told me that the planners have been working with them, they've talked about the, particularly the the um, floodlights. I was quite concerned about the floodlights, but the publicity, nobody has put any representations about it. They're not saying we don't like the floodlights. And my experience of the floodlights um, comes from uh, tennis courts up at now at Lindell Lane in Hutton, which replaced a lot of the Penwitham tennis facilities. I was quite surprised to see a photograph here with three tennis courts on it for, I don't know a huge amount about the population of Much Hool, but it did strike me as that, that seemed to be a bit of over, over provision, considering in higher Penwitham in the short time I've been there, which is merely a quarter of a century, we lost four tennis facilities and they got eventually consolidated out to Hutton. Yes, I'd be worried about the bright light, but if the neighbours aren't worried about it and if the planners have been in negotiations with the applicants about it to dis discuss the design and so forth, I don't have a problem with that. So I'm back to my problem is this appears to be Sports England being desperate to get their boxes ticked. And I did wonder whether it was a matter of, and I'm sorry to, to the applicants, I was, did wonder whether it was just a matter of they were trying to whiz it through because they got fed up with trying to deal with the bureaucracy of it all. I don't get that impression now. I get the impression that there is a bit of a hold up. 
and maybe the deferral is the right way to go with this to try and get it through and get it res resolved for us. Uh, thanks, Councillor Shaw. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm not quite sure what to, to say after to all that, but uh, I did take the opportunity of ringing Janice up this afternoon and uh, um, having a, a chat to her about um, my thoughts on it, I suppose, at that time, although I have read it several times and sort of changed my mind about three or four times. So, um, but, uh, um, so I was hoping that to come here this evening and obviously listen to what um, the colleagues around the table have said and listen to what they're more importantly what the uh, the people from uh, much hool have said um, um, my view I think hasn't really changed since uh, I spoke to Janice this afternoon in the in the sense that um, I would be supporting the residences and I would probably and I'll leave it for a second be uh, going for approval on it um, it, it was a bit of a pity and you know, that this wasn't sort of uh, an outline application because an outline application as in a planning a permission in principle um, would have allowed them to have a planning permission on it then to go away and sort out the detail and then come back for a full application as and when the detail was sorted out. Now, I don't know whether that's possible now at this meeting, but that would give them the the armoury to go away with to try and do the fundraising, know that they've got um, an agreement in principle, if you like, as in an outline permission. Um, that was that, I think that's the first thing I'd like just to to clarify, Chair. Thank you. Okay, I'll I'll bring Dave in on the outline um, position for you. Yeah, I mean the short answer is no, you can't. It's an application for a full permission. You can't change it to an outline permission at this stage. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, do you still want to go for approval, Councillor Smith? Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to come back, Chair. Please. Yeah. I'd like to come. Um, back. Come on then. <clears throat> I will. Don't worry. Um, this community group in Much Hool that I um, have to say I've supported for many, many years now um, with regard to the building of the hall and the moving out of a wooden shack and, and, to, and to see that um, everything they've done there and the energy and enthusiasm that they've had to create what they've done on that site is absolutely fabulous. Um, and it certainly, I think they, they could go ahead and make a, make a real go of this. I have... Um, some difficulties with Sport England. I've had difficulties with Sport England on several occasions over many, many years, to be quite honest. And um, and when um, it was said that they have form, well, they certainly have form. Uh, and for me, Sport England tend to put obstacles in the way of achieving sporting activities. And that's all they seem to do. Um, and it is a tick box exercise. I've been through it several times over many, many years now. It is a tick box exercise. Nevertheless, there's, there's the boxes there to tick. The, other th the only thing that concerns me is that community groups like this, when they want funding, have then got to go back to Sport England, go back to the, N at the national uh, NGBs. Um, so they will have to, if they want it, will probably need to go to the Football Foundation, who have all the money via Sport England. Um, and it's, it's a bit difficult to fall out with somebody on that stage and then and then go back to them afterwards for funding uh, unless they've got, I mean, I don't know their, their situation, whether there's funding coming from elsewhere. Um, and that, that concerns me, I have to say. Um, but I have no doubt in my mind that um, these people from Much Who can actually make this work um, with or without Sport England. Uh, to be quite honest, and I think over time that they will um, justify uh, what what they're actually doing. Um, there are other things that concern me, the, the makeup of them. We call it a mugger, the football pitch. We don't know what the base is. We don't know whether it's rubber crumb or whatever it is. So th there's lots of things in there which would have been quite useful um, in in a an outline application. Um, so um, I, I will propose approval, Chair. 
uh, approval in uh, supporting the residents in there um, because I think uh, they could very well just go away and lose heart, um, which would be which wouldn't be good, really. It wouldn't be good for them. It wouldn't be good for the community um, because you get volunteers doing an awful lot of work um, and sometimes they need something to work with. Uh, and I'd like to give them something to work with, Chair, so I would prove, uh, prove that. Um, it's obviously the, it's just been refused on, on, on Sport England's um, uh reasoning and i understand the reason for for sport england's reason but also on policy g7 um of which is something i don't agree with i think it complies ideally with g7 in that it improves the sporting activities in that area so uh, that's all i have to say at the moment chair thank you okay thanks councillor smith do i have a second of councillor smith's proposal for approval <coughs> Nope. OK, so we have had an amendment for deferral proposed by Council Mrs Mary Green, uh, seconded by Councillor Mullineau. Does anybody else have any other proposals and any, would anybody else like to come back? No? OK, so this is a show of hands in support of deferring the application so we can get more information from Sport England and the applicant, yeah? So all those in favour, please show hands. Dave? Um, that ultimately was a unanimous vote in favour of, of deferring the application, sure. OK, so the application has been deferred for more consultation. It's not been refused. OK, um, thanks for your attendance this evening. Thanks for your eloquence and your passion. It's great to see in small communities like Mutchul. I applaud you. Well done. Thank you. Let's move on to item number 10 now, Atlantic Industries, Bannister Hall Lane, Higher Walton. Sorry, Chris. Did I um, did 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 I did I confuse you then? The the running order has been changed. That's all. You just haven't been informed. Thank you, Mr. Happen. Yeah, you won't. Oh, I'm, I'm quite. <laughs> <What'd> you <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying <laughs> this. I'm all, you won't be in formality. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Um, Chris, if you'd like to introduce uh, present Atlantic Industries, thank you. Yeah, I just need to find out where the presentation is. It's been jumping all over the show tonight. Um, is it? Keep going then. There we go. Thank you, Chair. The application relates to an existing storage and distribution unit which is located within the Bannister Hall Works site. The site is allocated under policy G1 of the Southrable Local Plan as Greenbelt. Access is taken from a 900 metre long unadopted road with the development comprising of several industrial units. The minimum distance um, of 73 metres would be present from the proposed extension to the closest residential property. The site is separated by other industrial units that provide screening to give, uh, to give with mature trees. The proposed extension would be located along the eastern boundary of the site and would measure 12 metres wide by 40 metres in length. The extension would have a dual pitched gable roof measuring 5.5 to the eaves and 7 metres to the ridge. The extension uh, would be constructed with uh, vertical box profile cladding uh, to the walls with uh, red face and brick upstand and the roof would be constructed from insulated roof panels. 
proposal will allow for extra storage um, of the company's products, which is required to support the growing business. The proposal would be constructed on an existing area of hard standing and would be contained within the operational area of the site. The extension is to be enclosed by existing large industrial units on all sides. Neighbouring units uh, to the east of the, uh, of the proposed extension are set at a higher level, the ones at the rear. Whilst Greenbelt policy restricts the erection of such buildings on the grounds of inappropriateness and on the impact on openness, the very special circumstances outlined in paragraph 7.3.2 and 7.3.3 .3 are considered to outweigh the harm that would be caused. The development would be enclosed by existing built development within a defined previously developed curtilage. And there's also economic benefits associated with the proposed extensions. For these reasons and those contained within the report, the application is recommended for approval subject to the imposition of conditions. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for your presentation, Chris. Um, right, we don't have any objectors to this application, we don't have any supporters, we don't have any ward members and we don't have the agent. So let's open it up to committee. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to say that this one's fairly straightforward in my mind. I, um, I'm not too, too sure why it's come to committee, to be perfectly honest, but I don't know if there's, if there's something which is... Okay, because of size. Fair enough. Um, yeah, for me, I think it's fairly straightforward. Again, it's positive that we can support um, a local business within South Ribble to expand even further to, to benefit the uh, local economy. So um, <laughs> I'm very happy to support the officer recommendation uh, for approval with conditions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Adams. Councillor Farmworth. Just want to echo Councillor Adams' comments uh, in relation to the you know the benefits to employment opportunities and you know there's no objections for from the consultees so i'd like to second uh, approval with conditions okay thanks council if i'm with i'm going to wind this debate up have we got any other proposals no let's go to the vote then this is for approval a show of hands please dave yes that was unanimously approved chair
Okay, my apologies for that. Uh, moving on um, to Hurt Plant Hire. Uh, Debbie, if you'd like to introduce this item, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just hang on, my point has disappeared. All right, here we go. Um, Hertz Plant Hire is at the centre of Lancashire Business Park in Farrington. To the south and east, we've got a lot of large warehousing. Beyond in the east is the railhead, and that's relevant to this application. In the north is Leyland Trucks. A piece of land directly adjacent to Hertz Plant Hire has just been approved for truck and battery storage, so it's not the green space that it looks on this on this picture. On the west, we've got Enterprise Drive, which runs through the business park. And beyond that is Global Renewables, which is the waste management centre. Um, the whole business park's designated under policy E2. And the prime aim of that policy is to protect and enhance employment. The applicant's business is mainly used as a transport hub um, for the main business and as, as well as other things for recycling, screening and processing hardcore and other materials. It's currently a 24-hour processing use and it sits against a backdrop of 24-hour uses as well. You just bear with me, it's quite a big, quite a big scheme, so I've got a few photographs just to set the scene a little bit. Um, this is the site access onto Red Rose Drive from Enterprise Drive, which is the main access through. Hertz is on the left and as you can see it's surrounded on all sides by a large scale employment. This is a view facing Hertz here and Leyland Trucks are here and the same view but facing down Enterprise Drive with Hertz on the left. The recycling plant is behind this beyond large scale industrial. The application, this is a photograph of the application site should give you a rough idea of where each bit is, but I'm going to go into that later. But it's facing eastward, so we've got the railway siding, which is roughly here. Uh, Leyland Trucks is on the left, and this sort of pipe, if you will, is the remains of the wind turbine, and the application includes demolition of a wind turbine. This is Sandham House, the main headquarter building within the site, and that's viewed from Red Rose Drive, the main access. They've got their own car park here, and just off the photograph, there's another car park here, and the rear elevation of Sandham House within the site. And the last one, this is the existing building in the northeast corner, so you've got Leyland Trucks behind, and the railway side in around here, where my pointer is. Um, you can see the site's really industrialised. It's surrounded by large-scale buildings and the bu these buildings screen visually and offer noise limitation. OK, the proposals, quite a lot of it. Um, it's all described in your report and I'll go into more detail for the big bits in a section. But starting on the left-hand side, moving clockwise, we've got Sandham House, which is the existing office. That's going to be retained. And there is a, already a way bridge here, which will be upgraded, increased in size. On the back of that, there will be a new circulation routes and manoeuvring space for HGVs. So you'd have an in and an out. There's a new access to be provided onto Red Rose Avenue as well. Red Rose Drive, I beg your pardon. It'd be a large workshop erected along the northern boundary with Leyland Trucks and HGV parking area with electric vehicle charging points. A new concrete plant in the northeastern corner, and I will go into more detail about that because it's quite a big one, and adjacent, the existing recycling area will be kept, and a new jet wash bay. Um, new storage bays along the front of the access with Red Rose Drive, now they'll be screened by Hedge Rose, and in the centre of the site will be an asp asphalt processing plant. Um, the turbine is roughly around here. Um, it's not as bad as it sounds. It never worked. It was never finished. But to put it in context, the height is relevant because if it was completed, it would stand at 40 metres, um, 27 metres with a maintenance platform. And the highest part of this next proposal is 27 metres, so where the maintenance platform would be. And that permission for the, the turbine is extant. They could finish it off if they needed to. 
Okay, the proposed asphalt plan, it's not easy to see. The, the drawings are very detailed, but it comprises three silos, five feeder bins, and a plant prep, plant prep, I can't say it, plant platform with associated infrastructure delivery and shoots. Um, maximum of 27 metres high, but it reduces in height as it re as it rises. And the widest point is this platform at 11 metres. Now, that will be screened by Sandham House, which is a roughly 10 metres high. Buildings facing across Red Road Drive, they're all about 10 metres high as well. It's more of a selection of associated plant than a building, this bit. The proposed concrete plant, which will be in the northeast corner adjacent to Leyland Trucks and towards the side of the railway siding, a shallow roof processing building with two silos and four hoppers. Um, it's 31 metre by 38 metre footprint, but it's only 12.2 metres high. Again, the, the buildings adjacent to it are between 10 and 15 metres high. Um, for both processes, materials arrive and leave via the most sustainable route. Now, that might be on, on the road, but it's likely that it will be via the railhead, which is 20 metre, 200 metres east of this site, within the same industrial estate. And it was subject to a 2023 approval for delivery and distribution of aggregates. Um, it's expected that there'll be little material impact in highways terms because of this scheme. In fact, it's likely it will take some of the, the vehicles off the road. Okay, just elevation showing you storage build storage bays will be which will be behind hedges along Red Rose Drive. And the proposed workshop, which will go against the Leyland Trucks building, um, inspection pits, workshops for the vehicle mechanics, mezzanine and a canteen in there. Noise, odor, quality, air quality, all been assessed by environmental health and they're acceptable because it's in an employment area and subject to conditions, which were on your report. And the visual impact in assessments also been provided um, in an industrial estate context. We feel this is acceptable, particularly as the wider parts of this development are behind the existing buildings. We've no objection from Lancashire County Council or from any statutory council team, and surprisingly, no resident objection or representation at all. So on the basis of the economic benefits, the site context in an industrial area, it's the most appropriate place to put this, and no objections from anybody. Um, we go for approval with conditions. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for your detailed report, Debbie. Are you sure there's no objections from anybody? Right, so we've no objectors, as Debbie says, we've no supporters, we've no ward members, we don't have the applicant or the agent. We do, however, have um, Councillor Will Adams and Councillor Hayden Williams to speak. Thank you, Chair. I, I mean, I think we probably don't have any objectors because the report is very good and very clear, and I think Debbie outlined it very well. Um, this is, I think, of great benefit um, to, to the borough, to, to the community. Uh, and for the economy as well, for the local economy, which we, we've talked about quite a lot tonight. And I think, you know, we've got a, a responsibility here to um, to support another, I'm not sure, a small or medium size now for, for Clive Hertz uh, with the size of, of it. But, you know, this this will only uh, increase um, their business and improve their business even further. Um, so it's a, a very easy decision for me to, to go with approval with uh, the conditions set out in the report. Thank you very much, Councillor Adams. Councillor Williams. Um, yeah, very simple. Uh, this is it, it's a it's, it's a big employer in the area. If you're going to build something like this, you would build it right in the middle of an industrial estate. There is nowhere better. It's not going to impact any visual amenity or anything like that. So I would second approval. Easy. Okay, thanks, Councillor Williams. Councillor Mrs. Mary Green. Um, yeah, I agree with our with our colleagues. It's a thriving business. If you're ever up there at certain times, there's seems to be hundreds of vehicles of Clive Ertz going in and out uh, of their existing place. It's a thriving business. I think we need to promote businesses like this. And um, like Debbie has said, it could relieve the traffic a bit with the new way of, of doing it. It's not in any area that's bothering anybody. So I would say as long as there's conditions on it, that's fine. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Phil Smith. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, whilst I'd dearly love to get rid, of, get rid of some of these huge, great trucks hurtling through the borough, um, it isn't going to happen. We need them. So um, um, I, I will be supporting it. Um, what it appears to be from me, it, for me is that it, it's, it, it's actually up, upgrading the premises, bringing it, I won't say into the 21st century, but maybe the 20th century. Um, it's certainly improving it. So, um, uh, yeah, we'll be supporting this, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Smith. Um, yes, Councillor Unsworth, I'm, I'm glad you're still with us. <laughs> um, yeah, I just really wanted to say how glad I was that they're using the railway in sidings and that that's a real, the more that that happens, the better. Absolutely agree. Okay, have we got any other proposals on this? Just as a matter of interest, Clive, Clivert was a very good footballer for the Netherlands football team. But there you go. It's not the same one, obviously, but there you go. <laughs> it was called Patrick Clivert. <laughs> okay, um, right, can we have a show of hands for approval then, please? All right, Dave. That was unanimously carried approved, Chair. That was a bad joke. Yeah. Okay, moving on swiftly. Um, Lisa will... Oh, no. Lisa, Lisa is presenting. She is. Oh, smashing. You're better then? No, it's Rachel who's not well. You're well remembered. Hi, Lisa. You're, you're presenting this item tonight to Churchill Way, Leyland. I'm going, I'm going to be quiet now. Oh. Good evening, everybody. Um, the slide in front of you represents the location of the existing Domino store to the east which is in the gap at the centre here. And then the position of the relocated, proposed relocated Dominus, Domino store, which is the line hatched in red here. The application refers to Unit 2 Churchill Retail Park and relates to a proposed hot food takeaway, which is the reason it is at committee this evening. Sorry, just... This isn't all honest, though. Yep, yeah, thanks, Debbie. So this, these aerial images show Churchill Retail Park. To the west of the proposed site is the existing little supermarket. You can see on the historic Google Earth pictures the previous pound stretcher store, which is now closed down and is currently vacant, where the unit is proposed to be relocating to, which is positioned to the east. To the east of the site is the existing B&M store, and in the foreground is the McDonald's to the, to the bottom of the to the image at the right hand side there. These are just some additional photographs of the retail park, which clearly shows the position of the existing pound stretchers or the previous pound stretcher store, which is vacant. This application before us this evening will allow the existing B&M store to move into the vacant store to increase the size of that unit, which the current Domino's um, takeaway would preclude. These images show the existing access into the service area to the rear, which is accessed off Golden Hill Lane. These are some images of the proposed um, new Domino's shop front and the plant, which is positioned to the rear on the image to the bottom. And this shows the proposed floor plan and it's in enlarged extract of the floor plan. Much of these um, will be existing systems which can be relocated from the existing store and reused. Servicing is proposed to be from the rear, which is the same as the existing store, and extract ducting will be rerouted through. The application is recommended for approval. It is obviously here this evening because it consists of a hot food takeaway. It's recommended for approval for the reasons given and it would also support the local economy with the increase in jobs through the expansion of the proposed B&M store. Thank you. 
So thanks for your presentation, Lisa. Welcome to South Rural. Um, Councillor Will Adams. Thank you, Chair, uh, and welcome, Lisa, and thank you for your presentation. Um, maybe I should declare an interest uh, in the fact that um, I've got a love for the uh, pepperoni pizza that they do, um, but it's not prejudicial, I assure you. Um, no, I, I think being serious, I think, again, it's a, it's a straightforward um, application. I think, uh, again, it's another business which is expanding, which I think, again, we should support uh, moving forward. So uh, in my mind, it, it meets all of our requirements uh, and I agree with the uh, the officer recommendation um, for approval with conditions and I would like to propose that chair thank you thank you for that uh, council Adams council of um, I think it's really the proposal is a good idea it makes perfect sense to me um, the last thing we want is a large long-term empty retail unit um, following the uh, the closure of, I think it was Pound Stretcher. So I think we've got we're lucky that we've got a business who is already there and wants to expand. And uh, you know, with, with the um, the takeaway moving um, to the left. So I fundamentally think mm -hmm. that the employment factors and and the employment opportunities is good. So I'd like to second Councillor Adams's proposal with conditions. Okay, thanks, Councillor if I'm with us. I've messed up again and I, I forgot to say there's no objectors and no supporters and there's no agency at all. Councillor Smith. Yes, thank you, Chair. I mean, it's a sensible application from sensible businesses supporting each other and it's uh, it's nice to actually see that. Um, and we obviously, uh, hopefully they go on and make a, an even bigger success of what they're doing, so I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks, Councillor Smith. Right, um, do we have any other proposals on this application? Are we all happy to draw the debate to a close and go to the vote? Okay, so a show of hands for approval, please. Okay, Dave? Yes, Chair, sure, that's unanimous vote in, in favour and for approval. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, right, final item this evening, item 13, Statement of Community Involvement, the Views of the Planning Committee. OK, and Catherine is um, presenting. Thanks, Chair. Yes, so um, we're required um, by the regulations um, relating to planning to actually prepare a statement of community involvement. Um, some new regulations came in in 2017 that said we had to renew our statement of community involvement every five years. And ours is quite dated because so our last SCI was uh, adopted in 2013. So we're just on the cusp of having to get it done this year, really. So we've reviewed the existing statements of community involvement. And we've looked at um, the statements of community involvement from our partner uh, councils of Preston and Chorley. And we've looked at West Lancashire's because they've uh, recently re renewed theirs to so look at how they're engaging with uh, their stakeholders, with the community, with members of the public in, in the planning process. And so we've reviewed our statement of community involvement and basically it explains how we will engage with interested parties in different areas of planning practice. So in preparation of development plan documents, so that's planning policy and also in development management. So in terms of uh, development plan documents, as I'm sure you're aware, we're currently in the process of working with our neighbouring authorities to produce a new central Lancashire local plan. And so, therefore, it's important that we actually make sure our statement of community involvement is up to date and sound, because when we go through local plan examination, the inspector will need to know that we have engaged our communities and consulted on that document in the way our SCI says that we will. So we've looked at um, our current methods of consultation. Obviously, things have moved on since 2013. There's a lot more use of digital technology to engage a wider reaching audience, and we've adapted it accordingly. Um, so you will see in the actual document that's attached, we've listed how we will consult in terms of a local plan preparation, which is a development plan document, how we will consult in terms of if we're producing a supplementary planning document and how we will assist a community who wishes to prepare a neighbourhood planning document. So we those those matters are not dissimilar that we already uh, consult in that way. It's really just formalising our procedures. 
We've also looked at development management and we've outlined how we will engage people in the development management process, whether that's having advice on our website about householder development to help people decide whether planning permission is needed, directing them to the planning portal and other advice uh, centres, whether it's publicising our uh, pre-application advice um, which we're able to, you know, obviously provide to potential applicants for planning permission. And it also explains how we um, consult in terms of planning applications and how we notify residents which type of applications we might need to advertise more widely, um, in, in, in perhaps in terms of press notice or something of that nature. And it explains how what the members' role really is in community involvement, particularly in relation to representing uh, constituents, coming to perhaps representing people at planning committee if they don't want to actually speak themselves. Um, and, it, and it explains to members how, how they can, um, you know, how residents how can come to planning committee. Um, it also touches on appeals, but that's a light touch because obviously that procedure is uh, effectively governed by uh, the planning inspectorate. Um, what we have done is obviously we've rewritten the draft document and we're taking it to council in November. Um, we propose that um, if council are happy with this approach, we put it out for consultation in the spring with a view to seeking wider views on the document and uh, then obviously taking account of any representations we receive and bringing it back to council in March for, for adoption. Thank you, Chair. Council Shaw. Thank you, Chair. Two two little points. Um, it mentions the situation with neighbourhood development plans of which we have Penwitham. Um, Penwitham are reviewing whether or not they still want a neighbourhood development plan in view of the fact that all the funding that went, supposedly went with it seems to have disappeared off into the County Council or something. Um, the other issue and it's just a little one that just occurred to me on um, 6.7 the planning committee stuff we had a situation here today where two applications from my area came up and i felt that i was suddenly in a fortunately david councillor howarth turned up to um, to speak on them but it, we're not in all situations can we actually represent our um our constituents um without compromising our position on the committee and I think something around that sort of area would be helpful within that paragraph if possible. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right here that there aren't looking around there's n there aren't two ward members from one ward on this committee is there? So there'll always be because each each ward has at least two members, David, yeah? Yeah? Some have three. So if there's a member on the committee, he doesn't have to be compromised if his core council come and address us, she will. It's just a, it's just a point. Catherine? Or? Yeah, certainly, Chair. I mean, obviously, we can, th these are just for, for comments, mm. really. And the comments can be sort of presented to council mm. and discussed there. But but in general, in, in the other authorities where I've, I've worked, exactly as the Chair says, if the ward council, if there is a ward council on planning committee, generally, it would be the other ward councillor mm. who would perhaps come to, to committee and represent views where possible. Good. Yeah, come on, Dave. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I fully accept that. I, I, I recognise that when I think about it. I just recall we did have one member who, through a planning committee, insisted on several times representing his, um, the, his residents, um, despite sitting on the committee, um, and came back into the debate four times in respect of his resident and didn't declare an interest on it. So that was the one that had suddenly hit my head. But you're right, we have two or three members in each ward. OK, thanks. Are we still being live streamed? Yes. Is the live stream still? OK. Yeah. All right. I'll mind myself then. Councillor Adams. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, no, thank you for uh, for the document. I think it's really helpful to see. I would. Uh, I would kind of say that I think this committee um, 
certainly in the four years or all four years now that I've uh, sat on here, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I think the way that we engage with our community, actually, I think is probably an example to, to many. Um, I know um, speaking to other members of planning committees who, on, in different authorities, um, certainly uh, don't get the same um, engagement with their community. Um, I mean, sometimes you probably could say we probably engage too much, um, which I think has probably affected us uh, previously uh, in a negative way. So I think there is a balance uh, to make. But, um, you know, I think it's from our point of view, I think this document is is welcomed. I think it will be the only thing I would say in relation to it is the uh, the consultation events, um, how how we advertise those and make sure that we get them out. Uh, as soon as possible and, and they're held at a time when most people in in those particular areas will be able to go for instance um my constituency in Middleforth, it would be probably not very prudent to go um between the hours of nine and five because most people around there are working whereas possibly another community might uh, might have a, an old demographic who aren't possibly but that was the, the only thing i would say um, but I think it's a very good document, and I think it will pull, it would help us as a as a committee moving forward as well. So um, I know there'll probably be more debate about it at the council meeting. So I'll uh, I'll save any further comments for them. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Adams. Councillor Mrs Green. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, there's just two or three points on page seventy nine. Paragraph 24, it's on about the consultation events are going to, going to be held in the day and evening. I'm just aware that um, really I feel you should have two consultation events. Um, for instance, in areas like Leyland and Eastern, where there's big populations and they have many wards in that area, uh, seven wards and six wards respectively, it might be more appropriate to have you know, two consultations in an area like that rather than one. Um, on page 81, uh, paragraph 41, um, it's on about notifying the neighbours by letter, etc. cetera. Um, normally, I know on, on applications, it's usually the, the residents very close to the application. Um, perhaps on, on this sort of thing, they could be sent out on a wider area, wider distance than the, the people that are very close to the applicants. Um, and lastly, number 47 on the same page 81, it says consultation on the draft SCI will be held for four weeks. Um, I suggest it could be better six weeks to allow responses. For instance, areas like parish councils don't meet every month. So perhaps they could need a bit longer to respond. So six weeks would give them a little bit longer than four weeks. That's all really. Thank you. OK, thanks, Councillor Green. Councillor Williams. Um, yeah, um, having recently been elected a member of Farrington Parish Council, I know that uh, as certain members of the planning team will know, there are certain sensitivities in certain areas about uh, planning applications that may or may not affect them. Um, it, 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 we say stuff around press notices and newspaper. I'm, I'm just wondering whether a newspaper is an outdo outdated concept these days. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, whether we can make use of more press and, and not online advertising as such, but um, make more no make more note of online sources where people can source information and source the list of stuff that's public. Yes, they can search on the planning portal for things, but the planning list that we get on, on a weekly basis is really, really useful. And we pick stuff up quickly and things like that. So I'm just wondering whether there can be more of a link to that document rather than the planning portal. I think that might be helpful. And, and also around the, the planning consultation, I, I'd agree six weeks would be better. It depends on the timing of a parish council. If, you know, if, it, if, it, if, a, if a consultation opens at the start of the month and the, and the meetings at the end of the month, it only gives like a couple of days to get responses back. So I think opening it out to six weeks to encompass that, especially around all the, the parish councils, I think would be more useful. Okay, thanks, Councillor Williams, and congratulations on becoming a parish council recently. Uh, Councillor Molyneux. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I also agree about that time scale of four weeks. If we could improve that to about six weeks, that would make, a, I think, a big difference. 
Um, publicity is key, isn't it? In this case, when you're looking at consultation, you need to get that out to uh, as many people as you can. Um, and I know, I know we do a lot with social media now, um, but we got to we have got to remember that there's there are people who don't deal in that, you know, and and they don't want to be left uh, unaware of things. So, from a point of view of having more um, community involvement events. I think we could do with having more and more than that. And I think when we look at um, the local plan with LCC and others, there was very little. Um, I didn't think there was enough events there for people to come and voice their opinion. Um, so for me, if we could improve and get maybe more events happening, so we hopefully we'll get more people involved. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Mullineau. Councillor Unsworth. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was looking at page 81 and it says that some applications must be advertised in a newspaper and site notices may be displayed. Is there some sort of legal thing that we have to put it in a newspaper? Yes, I mean, in certain cases, there's rather archaic legislation in place because I agree with what Councillor Williams is saying. It's it's ridiculous these days that you do have to advertise um, in certain papers and you do pay a, a exorbitant cost for the privilege as well. So I think wherever possible, we move, move away from that, but it's not always possible. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else before we tie up? Nope. Okay, have you took notes? Of, would you like to sum up? Just yes, I'll sum up. Thank you, Chair. So, um, obviously, some of those comments are really useful, and um, particularly around, um, you know, it, perhaps it looking to increase the, uh, perhaps the number of consultation events in going forward in the local plan process. So, got a note of that. That when we go out to, uh, if 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 council approves a statement of community involvement, to go out potentially for a six week consultation to allow for. Um, you know, parish councils potentially who, who don't meet as frequently. Um, obviously, there is, as, as Dave says, a statutory requirement to advertise in the press. Um, now, obviously, local authorities campaigned about that previously because there are costs to the council. And we are aware that actually most people don't receive a local newspaper any longer. So, you know, it, it is something that I think going forward, the government will look at and potentially may remove that requirement. For, but the for current time, it is a requirement and we do have to abide by the regulations. And the only comment I would make in terms terms of the suggestions that have been made was that uh, councillor mrs green and i fully understand why members might like to do a wider uh, neighbor notification um, th than the regulations usually require however we already go beyond because the regulations require you to either display a site notice or write to neighbours that adjoin the site. So we already go beyond by writing to, to all the residents. And if we have an arbitrary at list where we randomly select which neighbours we think will be impacted, that creates difficulties because it's difficult to be consistent and somebody will say, well, you've written to A and you've not written to B. And so we try to stick with what the regulations require to avoid those grey areas. Plus, there are costs to local authorities, obviously, of sending letters, not just in officer time to generate them and print them, but there's the cost of posting. And we're moving to a more digital sort of way of, uh, uh, you know, a way of working. And so for many local authorities, they stick with the actual, you know, requirements, maybe not just to put the site notice up, but actually to write to the neighbours that immediately join the site. And because, as, as we all know, um, there are wider ways of publicising and we can certainly look to whether we can put a link to the weekly list, you know, in a more prominent location on our website. Um, we, we find that we receive comments from people, even if we've not directly notified them, they are aware because either they've seen it in the press or they've seen it on the website. And I think you know, writing individual letters is something that we do want to try and perhaps restrict if, if, if we can. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> well, if you're new to the planning committee, that's probably the longest meeting you've <laughs> had so far. Let me advise you, you'll get longer ones than tonight. But anyway, thank you all for your participation this evening. Many thanks to Councillor Adams. I know you've busted the gut to get here. And it, uh, listen, the job you do, 
you've got every right to be late, Councillor Adams. So I, I just thank you. Thank hey, you could see the job I do. And I'm waiting for him to eat that pizza. <laughs> <laughs>